Over the past month, we have heard some compelling sermons from this pulpit inspired by the gospel lessons assigned to each day. Meanwhile, over in the Old Testament, we have been listening to the Hebrew people as they have been breaking the bonds of slavery and learning to take tune their hearts and minds to the voice of the Lord, who is leading them from bondage into freedom. We have listened as lectors described how God heard the cry of God's people in captivity. We have watched Moses ascend to a position of power in order to lead God's people out of Egypt. There have been plagues and pestilence, pestilence dramatic divine showdowns, and finally a release of the Hebrew people. We are on the edge of the seats today as we heard about the Hebrew people walking literally through walls of water on both sides as the sea itself participated in the Hebrew people's liberation. And we listen with gratitude and horror simultaneously as those same walls of water came crashing down on the Egyptian armies who were trying to return the Hebrew people to subordination. What we didn't hear in the lessons of the great songs of Moses and Miriam praising God that the horse and rider have been toppled into the sea. Then in the 16th chapter of Exodus, this excitement subsides along with the raging waters of the Red Sea. The Hebrew people have finally been delivered and they finally now turn and face their freedom. This vast wilderness in front of them of which they know nothing. And even though being delivered from the bonds of slavery was unimaginably good news, they now face the daunting task that comes with freedom, having to take care of yourself. And in this particular lesson, finding something to eat, we can almost hear their stomachs begin to growl. So to show their profound gratitude to God and Moses for their liberation, they immediately began to complain against Moses, saying, this was all your big idea. Why didn't you just leave us where we were? We remember the flesh pots. We could eat our fill back in Egypt, romanticizing their enslavement because of their fear of what lies ahead of them, conveniently forgetting the whole making bricks without straw thing. I guess it's what we do as human beings when we are scared and hungry and we don't know what to do next. Complain loudly to the Lord. But God is God and God who heard their cries under the bond of slavery also hear their cries under the pangs of hunger. And the Lord says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. You know, scripture doesn't pick up tone of voice but I've often wondered, what was the tone of God's voice when he says, I will rain down bread from heaven? Was it, it's okay, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you? Or was it, you whiny babies, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven on you? Either way, he rains down bread from heaven and he gives him instructions about how to gather and to share it. What God provides for them is so different than anything they had ever experienced that they didn't even know what to call it. That's what the word manna means. What is this? So what we see in that lesson and in the lessons that will come in the following weeks is a series of events that reveal a, a cadence of fidelity for the Hebrew people as they learn how to be free and as they grow in their ability to hear and respond to God's voice, as they literally learn how to become response-able, to be responsible. As I look back over these texts for these many weeks, I can't help but connect this cadence of fidelity that was growing in this epic narrative. To be clear, I don't see a direct correlation at all between the ancient liberation of generational slavery and our modern life in the 21st century in Austin, Texas. But in this story, I do see a pattern that is well developed throughout all of Holy Scripture, both in the text of Old and New Testaments. What is revealed is the way in which God leads people into trust and into lives of faithful service. 
God is constantly revealing God's self to someone and then slowly bringing people along until a community of fidelity is formed. And then when life throws up the inevitable obstacles of life, God speaks in a still small voice, calling God's people along and providing some version of manna and quail along the way for their sustenance. This pattern is so clear that it's no wonder that the early Christian community associated gathering at this table and sharing a bit of bread and a sip of wine with manna and quail in the wilderness. From a timing perspective, I also can't help but connect our life at St. David's with this text. We, along with the rest of the world, have had to navigate the moral and social upheaval of a pandemic and the accompanying political and cultural chaos in its wake. We have had to do this as individuals. You've had to do it in households. We've had to do it in neighborhoods, places of work, and for us as a congregation. Add to that a particular upheaval here at St. David's as we moved out of this historic church for a year of much needed renovation. And while certainly moving to Bethel was not a form of slavery in any way, we did have to adapt what we were doing from the adaptations of all the things that we were already doing to adapt to the ongoing changing landscape of the pandemic and now the post-pandemic world, if in fact that is even a thing. Well, now that particular project is complete, mostly. So here we sit. And we can still hear the choruses of that first Sunday when we came back in, kind of our own versions of the songs of Moses and Miriam, celebrating God's goodness. It's still ringing in our ears. And as the waters of chaos have finally begun to subside, we can now turn our attention to the future. And as we look, we see uncharted wilderness in front of us. It is beautiful. No doubt. And there is much promise for the future. Confessionally, though, some of what we see is also frightening and daunting. So much has changed in our world, in the culture, in just this generation. And even more has changed just in the last three and four years. The trends are clear, and some of them are frightening, especially as a pastor of a church. There's a rapid exit from organized religious practice in the West, and in the U.S. in particular, and in Austin, and cities like it, even more so. And as anxiety-producing as that is, I find it even more frightening that some of those who are not participating in that exit are instead running to forms of Christianity that are more and more narrow and exclusive, harsh and mean-spirited. So what does that mean for us as Episcopalians? What does that mean for us at St. David's? What does it mean for a church that the presiding bishop calls the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, where we believe, again, quoting Bishop Curry, that if it's not love, it's not God. So what does that mean? What does this reality mean for us? Well, what I see in front of us is nothing less than that ongoing biblical invitation to listen to the voice of God. As God constantly leads us through what is simultaneously wilderness and promised land, we will listen to the God, the voice of God in strong, in our strong, well-established ways, in liturgy and formation and community engagement and advocacy, things we all know how to do and have known how to do for 175 years at St. David's. And then we will continue to live our lives together in ways that embody God's love and welcome. We will continue to be a place of love and welcome every single day. And we're going to listen carefully to the voice of God. And we are going to consider how we might actually do things differently in light of the past four years, in light of this new topography that's out in front of us. Just a couple of very specific examples of that exploration of new 
Kelsey, our youth director, Amanda, our children's minister, and Kristen, our, our curate, are gathering to think about ministry to children, youth, families, young adults, all of that in light of this new reality. What are the needs now in these areas? What do these people in our love, that we, whom we love in our midst, need from the church? Angela and the pastoral team are thinking about ways we can connect with the part of our congregation that is aging and finding the more and more crowded downtown Austin more and more difficult to get to church and just navigating this city. So what do they need from the life of their church? The vestry and staff have been brainstorming for about a year on something that we're simply calling Project 32. We need a better name, so I'm taking nominations for whatever better name you like. Uh, it's, uh, so Project 32 is a placeholder for an initiative that we will help us leverage our buildings and properties in ways that create sustainable ministries to teach more and more people about the love of God, to welcome more and more people into this body. And it will be things that are beyond the cadence of worship. That is new territory for Episcopalians. Right now, um, the list of things that are on the things that are on that list is very creative and very expansive, and we haven't even gotten to the part where we're going to ask you what you think about that, and we're looking forward to that. So, as we look into this beautiful and intimidating wilderness in front of us, some of the things we find will look familiar, and we'll also be called to be open and trusting to God as God provides for us other bread from heaven, other food in the wilderness. And those opportunities may be so different from the way we have traditionally done things, we'll all be scratching our heads asking, what is this? But through it all, God is calling. And through it all, I believe we will respond. We will resist the temptation to go backwards always. And God will constantly strengthen our ability to respond making us more and more response-able. And it is my prayer that as a parish, we will dance a cadence of fidelity as we follow God into this future. And we'll do it together in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.